and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. A lot of people say to me, why don't you have this person on the show? Why don't you have this person on the show? And the truth is, is I stopped asking people to come on the show a long time ago because I don't like rejection when they say no. So most of my guests come from past guests. And today, my guest is somebody I have wanted on the show, and I'm thankful he wanted to come on. He was introduced to me by a regular on Chef AJ Live, Lauren Burnick. He has a fabulous blog called Shane and Simple. And today he's going to talk about how he reclaimed his life through discovering a plant-based diet and making one of his famous recipes, chickpea curry in a hurry. Please welcome Shane Martin to the show. It's very nice to meet you. Well, thank you. You would not have twisted, had to have had to twist my arm to come on your show, just so oh, yeah. you know. So I would That's not have been you. Your kitchen is beautiful. Well, thank you. Uh, it's a bit deceptive right now. So we've been in the middle of a renovation for over a year uh, when we moved here to Mississippi. And um, we thought we were buying a house just to live in so we could build a house. And then we realized because we had a conscience, we can't sell this to someone else and a coat of paint is not going to fix it. And so the house is about 100 and almost 120 years old. And so we have basically rebuilt the inside. So my kitchen has just become functional over the last few months. But the best part about tearing a house completely out is you kind of get to decide how you want the inside to look. And so I don't know if we'll ever get to do it again, but we said, my wife was like, how do you want your kitchen to look and how do we want it to look? And so she did all the colors and the tile and we picked all that out. And I said, this is what I needed to do. And so here we are. So thank you very much. I do love it. I do love it. I'm just so and I'm glad you get this is the first time I've been on any show. So your your show is the premiere of my it's kitchen. Amazing. I had no idea. I just assumed you did this all the time. <laughs> no. <Nah. laughs> okay. Well, I've got we've got to share your story. And and you, I, I love the name of your blog, Shane and Simple. Where, where did that come from? So uh, about. 10 or 11 years ago, after I went plant-based, um, and I started following, um, I was following you, and I was following Rip Esselstyn, and Dr. McDougall, and all these guys, and had a lot of bloggers that I followed, and I thought, oh, man, my wife was telling me, you know, you need to talk about your story, and a lot of family members were asking me about what I was doing to lose weight, and so they were asking me about recipes. And so I thought, well, if anything, it's a good way to just put recipes out there and that kind of thing. Had no idea what, what a blog entailed, how to do it. Uh, didn't know anything about keyword research. And I started asking, my wife's a graphic designer. And so we were trying to just brainstorm what we we're going to call it. And we went through, I think one time we went through one called uh, Feast of Famine and then went through one called the plant-based menu and, and all these different things. And a buddy of mine, uh, Matthew Sakura and uh, Alyssa Sakura that I met in Mississippi uh, doing some plant-based stuff with them. They said, they said, why don't you just call it something with your name? Because, you know, it's, you know, you, you like to talk to people and your story is really, really life changing. And so anyway, my wife, we had moved back to Charlotte and my wife was out of town and I was starting to put recipes on the old name. I can't even remember what it was. And I was listening to a podcast and they said, look, cooking plant-based is not hard. And it can be, it's, you know, and it, it's fairly plain and simple. And I'm a simple guy. I don't like reading instructions on anything. I like to open packages and just try to figure it out. If it's too complicated, I give it to somebody else. And for me, that's kind of how I cook, using things that are already there and not using, you don't need all the special expensive things. And, and I thought, well, what if I just did a play on words, Shane and simple. So I called my wife and, you know, she's the most honest person in the world. And I knew if she didn't like it, she would tell me. And I said, what do you think about a name for the blog just called Shane and simple practical, not pretentious plant-based recipes. And she goes, I love it. It's your, that's your attitude. You know, like she said, just go with it. So that's kind of how it came about. And so, and I try to live true to the name of keeping everything as simple and as healthy as possible. So that's, that's it in a nutshell. That's great. So 11 years ago, you went vegan or plant-based. You're in Mississippi. That's not a place I think of as a Mecca for veganism. So tell yeah, us. Your story. 
So I've moved around a lot. I'm originally from Mississippi, but at the time I was living in Auburn, Alabama. And I had gotten up, I was, I didn't grow up an overweight kid. I was pretty healthy, worked out a lot. I actually went to college on a football scholarship and just getting out of college and not being made to work out and eating the, what I like to call the Southern American diet, you know, where we use pork as a seasoning down here. And I just, over the years, ate and ate and ate, quit exercising. And I think it was about two weeks before my 40th birthday. And I got on the scale one morning and I was at right at 300 pounds. Um, a few months before then, I started getting staph infections that wouldn't heal. I had all the signs of diabetes. Um, my blood pressure, the last time I'd had it checked, was like 153 over 106. My cholesterol from a physical was over 400. And the doctor actually sent me a letter and said, I need to meet with you. I need to talk to you about this and get this under control. Well, I never called him back and I never went back because I'm like, if I don't, if I don't deal with it, it doesn't exist, you know? <laughs> and, and so, but I just felt miserable. I felt bloated and just terrible. And I had a function I had to go to that very day that I had stepped on the scale. And I went to the mall in Auburn, Alabama, and I saw I needed a pair of black pants. And I walked up to the guy at the counter and he was an overweight guy. And I said, I need a pair of black pants. And he goes, well, look over in this section over here. And I was like, well, I, got, I like the ones on the mannequin. And he said, bro, those are cool clothes. He said, they don't make cool clothes for us fat people. And when he said us fat people, I didn't take that as shaming. I didn't take that as he was sliding. He was like, hey, you're one of me and we're together in this. And, and it hit me that the way others looked at me and saw me was not how I was looking at myself. And I think that was kind of a wake up call between the health and, and my appearance was, you know, it was sloppy. I mean, I was severely overweight. And, and, um, and so that day I reached out to a friend of mine and said, Hey, we had a mutual friend who had lost like 80 pounds and started doing Ironmans and he was on Rich Roll's podcast. And, and he said, yeah, man, he said, Thad went vegan. And I immediately went, no, I'm not doing that. Like that, because my stereotype of vegans were people that eat bark and soybeans and are healthy and don't take baths, you know? And so, and just stupid narrow mindedness. And he said, no, go watch the documentary Forks Over Knives, which Forks Over Knives for a lot of us was our entryway into plant-based eating. And I sat down with my wife that night, it was January 19th. And it was 2013 and we, we sat down and watched Forks Over Knives and I immediately go, I could totally do this. Like, cause they were, they were dispelling all the myths of you can't eat potatoes and you can't eat pasta and you can't eat bread and all the things I'm like, I think I could do without meat as long as I could have bread and pasta. And so they're showing all these things and ways to eat. And I love the science behind it. And I thought, well, I've tried everything else. So immediately I went cold turkey and, um, and because I love to cook, it was fairly easy to adapt. And so I, I started following Rich, um, uh, Rip Esselstyn and Dr. McDougall and just lived in their websites and uh, found Jeff Nelson's Veg Source channel on YouTube and started watching videos of all the speakers and Dr. Clapper uh, came across your story. And so, and, and so um, went cold turkey. And within the first two weeks, I think I dropped 19 pounds. And but I was eating. I was eating more than I had ever eaten as far as volume. I was just eating the right things. And so I think after about three months, I dropped 55 pounds. My blood pressure was around 126 over 79. And my cholesterol was the biggest thing. It had gone from over 400 to 199. And wow. there was, and then had a physical, there was no sign of diabetes. There was no sign of heart issues. The doctor actually even said, I wish most of my patients that came in here, you know, this was on a regular, but, and so that's when I went, okay, I'm all in. And, and so ever since then, it's just kind of been, and I became very passionate about it because when you find something that saves your life, you, you want to tell people. And 
so that's kind of when the blog idea started coming up and I was like, man, and I saw Rip speaking and I was just like, I would love to do this for a living because it's life changing. And so, so for a few years, dabbled ground trying to figure out how to start a blog and what that looked like. And then fast forward to 2017, we were living in Charlotte, North Carolina, our favorite place. We love North Carolina. And I just remember kind of finally making the site live and put out a grilled peanut butter and jelly sandwich for kids. And over the course of the next year and a half, got the blog monetized and went all in on it. And uh, October, January of 2020, uh, we went full time with the blog and been doing it ever since. So that's amazing. Do you have any before pictures? If, if they're not handy, is there any way to see them? I, I, I do. I can, I can, I, yeah, I can I can uh, dig some one way through, but uh, yeah, it's pretty um, it's pretty treacherous. It's pretty yeah, uh, it's it's uh, yeah. I'll find some. Everybody that sees it says your 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 weight loss self looks like your look your your fat self looks like your dad of your new self, and so. <laughs> That's just crazy. And it, what what? And your doctor said he had never seen that kind of transformation, right? Well, he was asking me what I did and, and I told him and immediately, you know, it shifted the converse. So at one point he's telling me, this is great. Awesome transformation. Uh, I love what you're doing. What are you doing? And then I say, well, I went to an all plant-based diet and he says, okay, well, we need to go check your protein levels and let's make sure you're getting a multivitamin. And, and, and I'm like, and I just remember rolling my eyes and I said, you know, when I came in here, and I'm eating meat and all the fried foods, you never once mentioned taking a multivitamin. Now, essentially, all I eat are nutrients and vitamins. And you're saying I need to take a multivitamin. Like the, the thinking just doesn't get me. And it's like, and of course, none of my levels were low. My B12, B12 levels were great. I was totally getting enough protein. I was starting to run a lot. I still lifted weights. I did CrossFit. So it's like, I just don't get the thinking. Like it just didn't, you know. But I was like, I said, no, I'm not taking a multivitamin. Everything looks good. I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing. He's like, well, keep doing it. We'll keep an eye on it. And of course, I never needed to get on a multivitamin. But so, but yeah, he was blown away. And and I was like, so sorry you didn't get that cell on the insulin. So, <laughs> you know, it's funny, um, like you mentioned, when, when people are overweight and eating terribly, nobody says anything. But the minute they start eating kale, everybody becomes a nutritionist. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, my son, um, uh, probably about six years ago, we were living in Charlotte and took him down to his yearly checkup and to see his pediatrician. I mean, my son's in college now, but I think he was in like the seventh grade would have been seventh or eighth grade. And the doctor actually came out and said, well, dad, you've got a, you've got a healthy son. And he said, and he looked at the charts and he goes, actually pretty. And, and this literally, these were the words he said, he said, Ab abnormally healthy. And I'm like, I don't even know what that means. I mean, and he said, he said, what do you do? And my son looked at him and he said, we eat plant-based. Well, immediately he goes, okay, well, I want to run a test on his vitamin D and his B12. Oh. <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> you know, so it's like, I said, go ahead. I'd love to see the results. So, you know, it's, that, but, you know, I've just kind of learned to live with that. And I just kind of shrug it off now. It's like, this is what works. You've seen the results and run all the tests you want, you know? So. Wow. When you went plant-based, did your family join you? Yeah. So we, we had, so I have five children and uh, yeah. And um, we uh, had just had our fifth. And so we call her our plant baby because that's all she had ever known. And um, so my oldest at the time was 12, my daughter. So I've got a daughter, son, daughter, daughter, daughter. So one boy, four girls. And, um, you know, my wife had always eaten like fairly clean and healthy. Like for her, if she had chicken or something like that, it was always more like a side dish and fruits and vegetables filled her plate. You know, she was very cautious about what she ate. Her lab results were always good. And when she was, when we had had Millie Jane, our youngest, we noticed early on, my wife nursed all our children. And so within the first few months of nursing Millie Jane, we noticed 
she cried a lot, had blood in her stool. And just, we took, talked to the doctor and found out that it was from uh, meat and dairy. It wasn't setting well with her system. So before we ever went plant-based, my wife went on a very restrictive diet, but it was not in the sense that it was, she eliminated dairy and meat and some soy, and she was eating corn, rice, beans, potatoes, and everything like that. And everything cleared up with our, with our daughter. And so I think about a year later, when I went plant-based, we started out as this is daddy's food and this is our food. So we tried that for about two weeks and we already had two children on soy milk because they had dairy allergies. We quickly realized that was going to be way too expensive. And, and my wife said, why are we doing this? They, she said, this is good for all of us. So we just made the switch and we tried to be very gracious with the children. We didn't come down with the hammer and saying we're doing this because this is all they had known eating a certain way and having certain snacks and, and, but we sat down and talked with them and said, one of the reasons daddy's getting healthy is because of the good food he's eating. And we just said, we want you to have the same benefit. And this is what's protecting daddy. And, and so when they looked at it like that and we included them in conversations, we took them shopping, taught them how to read labels. Um, a lot of times we would do a thing of taking them into the grocery store and giving them $5 a piece and say, okay, go find something that you want in the pantry and use what we, you know, so teaching them early on. And I think just um, including them on meals, letting them cook, we gave them a night of letting them come up with the menu. And um, so it, it, there was a little bit of a struggle and pushback and transition, but I think because we tried to include them and explain to them what we were doing and why we were doing it, it made it much more tolerable. And then they were like, well, daddy cooks really good. and and if and we also said, like, if they went to a friend's house for a birthday party and, you know, they had some ice cream or kind of fell off the wagon, we didn't chastise them. But what was funny is they would always come back home going, I don't feel so good <laughs> because they had started. And so we like we thought, well, that's the best lesson right there. You know, so. So anyway, so um, so early on, yeah, there was if it, if it was in the house and we ate, there's no question. This is how you eat, period. And so. Um, and so now I have a college graduate and one's in college and then three still at home. Um, you know, they, my older ones will dabble some and they know that I give them the stink eye, but they eat, I mean, they do as overall eat fairly clean and still close to the ground. So I try to take the win. And at the end of the day, they're becoming adults. And so they know how I feel. They know what I do and they're my children and I love them. And, and so, but they know when they come home, they know every meal they get is plant-based and completely, and they don't argue with that and they actually, you know, enjoy it. So. That is great. I, I, what, what's it like where you live the plant-based scene? Is there one? There is not one. Um, so um, very rural. Uh, it's a great place as far as the people, heart of the, you know, just very heart of gold people, very, it's a very blue collar town, but just people, you know, very, very communal, very community minded. Um, but again, very rural. Um, I don't know that most people even know what vegan means, to be honest with you. Uh, or are you just one of those guys that goes crazy when they see animals in zoos kind of thing, you know? And, um, but it, it's been interesting because um, a lot of people knew me, knew my family from here. So when I came back, and people found out I was do what I was doing. And, you know, I walk through Walmart now and literally somebody come up to me and stopped me the other day. They said, Hey, I just found that because I don't really talk about what I do. I mean, they know that I'm a blogger and a lot of people around here think that's cool because nobody blogs for a living around here. You know, Charlotte, it was a lot more uh, broad, but people now stop me and go, I just found out you're like one of these famous bloggers. And I, I'm just kind of like, well, I was like, I make a living, you know, I'm able to support myself doing it. And so um, people now are here, follow me on Facebook and they'll follow the blog and they'll reach out and I'll see them out at Walmart. And, but as far as the food scene, there's just, it's, it's all fast food restaurants. Uh, there's a few Mexican restaurants. There's one Japanese restaurant. We typically will, if we do eat out, we'll go to Tupelo or Corinth because they have some Thai places. Um, there is a really great market 
in Tupelo called the Whole Family Natural Market, and it's kind of like an independent small Whole Foods. So I'll go there just because it's supporting a local business. Um, but as far as the, but I tell everybody, Walmart has a great plant-based scene. You can eat completely plant-based going to Walmart. And but as far as the idea of it, yeah, it's 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 not a uh, there's not a vegan scene here at all. So or a plant-based scene. So I'm impressed with Walmart, how much organic they have. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, and that's why I tell people it's like people all the time are messaging me through the through the blog going, well, I live in a small town. I'm like, well, I do, too. And they're like, well, where do you get your stuff? And I was like, well, they even have nutritional yeast now here in this this little town, Walmart. So it's like we buy all our tofu there. We buy tempeh there. We buy all our produce there. They have, you know, whole grain flours. They have gluten free flours. So spices, I mean, and they do have a great organic scene. And if we need a bigger Walmart, we, like I said, we'll either go to Tupelo or Corinth up the road. And so, yeah, Walmart has a great plant-based scene. And I tell, and they're even um, actually, um, even in their canned aisle with their canned goods, they're starting to carry a ton of no salt added, their own brand, no salt added tomatoes and veggies and beans and things like that. So it's, you know, I mean, it, and so it's, we don't really have to go on Amazon or most places for special, I mean, a lot of those things like we used to. So it's, they're very accessible and very, um, you know, very available at Walmart. So, Yeah, fantastic. What do you like best about having a blog? The lifestyle. <laughs> I mean, I'm not going to lie. I mean, my wife and I were talking about it the other day. I don't, and I don't mean lifestyles of the rich and famous. What I mean is I love what I do. I get to, I get to create recipes and take pictures and I get to talk to people about what I do. And so um, my wife and I were talking about the other day, I said, do you realize for three years we've been able to support ourselves? She's a graphic designer. And then I do this. And, and I was like, we haven't had a boss in three years. And I said, I was like, eh. and so I think it's just, you know, when we want to take off, we take off. And now we work hard, but um, I, and it's been hard the last year and a half because with moving back here and then, you know, we've, we moved back here and during the renovation, we've had to move out twice and rent a place while the house was getting renovated. And so it made it hard to be consistent with the blog, but it would have been harder to have a normal nine to five job and try to do that. And so I just, I love, I get very nostalgic, my wife says. So I love getting out of the house and driving to Tupelo and finding a nice coffee shop and holding up and working when I need to. So I just, I, I just love, and I'm a creative by nature. I was a musician and I just, and I'm not a rule follower by nature. Rules are more like suggestions to me. <laughs> and so... <laughs> So I love they're more like up. suggestions. <laughs> yes. And so I, I, I just really kind of like the lifestyle just of being able to work in the house. And if I feel like walking around in my pajamas one day and working, I can do that. And, but it also has its drawbacks. I mean, you know, like we buy our own health insurance and we pay our own taxes and we get nailed for being self-employed, you know, so it's, there's, there's a pro and a con to everything, but when you're doing something you love, dealing with the bad things is a lot easier. And so that's why I tell people, and, and I'll just tell people, I did not become a full-time blogger until I turned 47. And so the idea that, well, it's too late to start, it is never too late to start following your passions. And so if you told me 10 years ago, I was going to be a full-time blogger, one, I would have laughed. And, but so, yeah, so, I mean, there are a lot of things I like, but overall, it's just the lifestyle of, being a blogger so what was your work before so um so when i left college i moved to nashville i was a full-time guitar player i toured around as a musician toured with different country artists and did some contemporary christian artists and did that for several years and then i was able to make a living staying in town as a session player where i played in the studio and then the music industry went soft in early 2000. And then I worked at Dell Computers just briefly selling computers. 
and uh, ended up going into ministry. And I was a music director for several churches. And so I did that for about 15 years. And then when the blog hit, it's, I was like, okay, I'm done dealing with people on a daily basis. So <laughs> it's like, I, and so I just I then became a blogger. And um, I feel like I have more impact as a blogger than I did in all the other areas. And I, I love everything I've done. And I've never had just this normal, you know, nine to five life. And uh, my wife is very different. I think she's the type she would rather me make $35,000 a year and know there's a check on the 1st and the 15th. And, you know, and I'm just kind of like, oh, it'll, it'll work itself out, you know. So we're definitely the yin and yang of each other. But I understood how you make money from a blog. I, I guess I'm just um, in the dark ages about that because it, it's free. You know, I mean, it's free for us to look at your beautiful blog. Right. And see, man, that was the thing. I was like, how do bloggers make money? But it's those annoying little ads that you see when you go to a blog. And I so I don't even notice them. I don't know what's wrong with me. I mean, I'm I I'm actually on your blog because I was going to ask you next what are some of your most popular recipes and I'm looking at them. And why do I not see the ads? Because you probably have an ad blocker built in. No, I don't have an ad blocker. I guess I just don't notice them. Well, good. Because I get messages about your annoying ads and I'm like, so I don't put those in there. Well, you're so right there, but I'm just looking at the recipe. I mean, they don't bother me because I just don't look at them. Well, there you go. So, so basically, very briefly, how we get paid is when you start hitting a certain number of page views, there are ad networks. I'm with a company called uh, Raptive. It used to be Ad Thrive. And basically, you apply and they look at all your metrics and then they bring you on. And they broker ads and they set up the code and where the ads get placed and people bid for ads. And so based on your page views, um, they tally up all the revenue each month. And then in, they're basically somewhat like our employer, but they just take care of getting us paid. And then they get a percentage of all the ad revenue that comes in. So, so my main source of income is ad revenue. Just like if a television runs a commercial, that's how the network survives. It's, the way the blogs survive. So that's so interesting. Do you get a say on any of the ads? Like would they put McDonald's on your blog, for example? So I can go in and it does happen from time to time and it's hard to filter out, but I go in and I, on my dashboard, I can have things that I don't want to see or promoted like topics, but occasionally I will get someone saying, Hey, someone was running a Burger King ad or something. But a lot of times the ad that you will see is not the ad I will see because it's based on your IP address and sometimes search history. So if someone's gotten on your computer and was looking at mechanics tools or going to Burger King to order something, there might be an ad that slips in and runs because the IP address read that in the history somewhere. So, so they try to block out what you don't want as much as they can, but no system is, is perfect and completely, you know, like somebody texted me one or messaged me through Facebook and said, oh, I went on your ad and I saw Starbucks and I'm I'm really offended because they're having all these protests and the way they're treating their workers. And I'm like, I have nothing to do with that. It's like they pay and it gets run and it's it's not a statement. It's not, you know, a position. So, I mean, but it's just like anything. It's like I just tell people, if you don't like the ad, turn it off. Same thing you would do on the television. <laughs> that is so interesting because Carlene is saying she feels bad using an ad blocker. I literally never noticed that there were ads on blogs. I guess <laughs> I just I, don't I, think I'm looking at something else. That's so funny that I could be that. Um, that Anyway, people are saying they love your blog. They love your recipes. Michelle says Shane's recipes are delicious and simple. And I just made spinach artico dip for a party and it was it. Uh, Cindy wanted to know, do you grow any of your own vegetables in your garden? We, so. We have never lived in a place where we were able to have a garden until we moved back here. So we're actually getting ready to create raised beds because my wife is really it loves. She has a green thumb. And so um, so we are actually now that we're getting the house close to where we can relax, we're going to start on the outside. And one of the things we're going to do is just create raised beds and we want to grow our herbs and vegetables and things like that. So we haven't done that yet because we haven't been able to but it is on the top list of priorities and something we're preparing to do. I'm trying to just figure out what the most popular recipe on your blog is. 
Uh, I would say, um, I can, well, let me see. I could, I could probably tell you right now, I've got my metrics. You know, that's one thing us bloggers do is we follow metrics. Like it's our, it's our, it's our Bible. So if I pull up my analytics, I would probably venture to say the most popular recipe, if I had to guess, and I'm about to find out, um, I'm about to find out. I would say I I think it's I think it's um, uh, probably one of my uh, uh, salad dressings um, because people are always looking for oil free salad dressings. Yeah, and um, that seems to have been something that. So let me pull up. Let's see. Actually, clicking around, I did see a before picture. Wow, I hope the audience can see one. Oh, you found one on there? Yeah, I, I clicked on something and there was like a before and after. Oh, well, okay. I found it. I'll tell you where I found it. I, I was clicking around and I clicked to see it. Well, it was there and now it's gone. Maybe it was under shop. I clicked shop and it says, Shane and Simple, you're holding a microphone and wearing a boutonniere. Oh, yeah. I was at a wedding. That was probably the year before I went plant-based. That was not at my heaviest, but close to it. Yeah. You look so much younger now. <laughs> yeah. I, I, my kids tell me they don't think I'm 50. I just turned 50 in February. So mm -hmm. I don't act like I'm 50. I can tell you that. I mean... I refuse to do that, whatever 50. So if, if I were to go over the last year of some of the most popular recipes, um, my cashew mayo is very popular. Um, I, cucumber and lemon water. I honestly, I didn't, I, I thought that was just going to be a throwaway recipe and it blew up and I was like, wow. Um, my vegan honey mustard dressing, again, salad dressing seemed to be the big thing that gets a lot of traffic. Uh, that one and my oil-free salad dressing, which is kind of like a balsamic, uh, my oil-free granola, and my oil-free bacon bits. <laughs> nice. I'm going to look those up. So were you always doing recipes even before you were vegan? Yeah, I love to cook. I've always, and, cook, and a lot of that I think came from, I came from a very uh, blue-collar family. And so both parents worked uh, incomes here. My dad was uh, a highway patrolman. So he worked for the state. My mom worked for a drugstore and then worked as a secretary and paralegal for law firms and things like that around here. And so growing up, now my grandparents grew almost everything that we ate um, and we lived very close to them. And so growing up during the summer, we were at my grandparents' house. My grandmother worked, my granddad built things. So it was kind of a fin for ourselves. So we were taught how to cook by our, our great grandmother and this, you just kind of learn it. And so by the time we're nine, 10, 11 years old, we're at a stove cooking things. And, and so it was just something we've always done. And as I got older, I just, I was always fascinated with the combination of spices and foods and, you know, trying to learn knife techniques and stuff like that. And, and um, so, yeah, I've always loved finding recipes and, I don't know if you've ever seen him, but when years ago, I found this guy called Sam, the cooking guy, and he's out of San Diego, California. And I just absolutely, and he was, he was, he's kind of does the non-vegan thing. I think of what I do. He's very simple, practical, and I just fell in love with the guy. And so he was kind of my inspiration to look and create more things. And, and so, but yeah, as far as I can remember, I've always loved to cook, even as a teenager, I cook for my friends. They come over to the house. And I just have always, just always loved doing it, but it was more out of necessity, not really out of, had a thought of making a living doing it. Cause I had an aunt and uncle that owned a restaurant and I learned very early. I didn't want to be in the restaurant business. Yeah, so. that's hard. That's hard. I work at one. It's, it's, it's hard work. So Ronnie's wondering if you're going to have a cookbook. Yes. So, um, so, um, working on doing a shame and simple cookbook and right now trying to decide if we want to try to shop to a publisher with the idea or just self-pub and actually and actually uh, a friend of yours um glenn merzer um glenn and i are going to be doing a book together 
and I'm going to be doing the recipes for one of his books. And, um, and, um, but hopefully within the next year or so, there's going to be a Shane and Simple cookbook. I'm actually finishing up a bread book right now for Harvard Press. And that's a whole nother story because it's, it, it's not really a Shane and Simple book, but it's a vegan bread book. And long story about that. But anyway, they had the book, they had the title, they had what they wanted done. They had the budget. They needed an author and said, hey, we found you. Can you do this bread book? And so I've snuck some healthy bread recipes in there, but they wanted a more of a straight ahead vegan cookbook. So there's things that I wouldn't promote on Shane and Simple. But I'm like, I try to look at it as a win of getting my foot in the door of do, doing a book with a major publisher and then, you know, being able to get the Shane and Simple name out a little more, hopefully, and having an inroad. But uh, yeah, hopefully within the next year, there's going to be a Shane and Simple cookbook. That sounds great. Well, you come back on the show and we'll definitely promote it. Do you uh, know, absolutely. Do you know who Billy Grislack is who's been on the show? Because people are saying you should play music with him. He's a musician. Oh, Okay. I, I've not seen Billy. I've not seen Billy. Yep. You know, you mentioned 19 pounds in two weeks, which is phenomenal. So how much weight did you end up losing in total? And how long did it take? About a hundred pounds. Wow. Uh, um, the, um, I think overall it took, it took less than a year. Um, you know, and a lot of that initial weight loss in the first three months came because I was, there's no telling how many calories I was eating on the diet that I was on, like with the hamburgers and the onion rings and the milkshakes. And the, I mean, I literally, for instance, at least two nights a week would go to McDonald's, get a Big Mac, a large Coke, a large fry, a six piece McNugget and a filet of fish sandwich. And that was my dinner. And so when you go from eating all of that on a daily basis to you're still eating a ton, but you know, it's like I probably cut my calories in half at least. And so, uh, but I was never hungry because I was filling my body with, you know, that's food. That's part of it. To me, like calorie density is the best part of eating this way. And, and be, be, some people still don't get it, but like we get to eat so much food. Uh, well, and that's the thing. It's like, I tell people, it's like, I, yeah, you can, you can eat the wrong things on a whole food plant-based diet. Like you can't sit and eat nuts and avocados all day and expect to lose weight. I mean, you can't, but you know, when you're talking about eating corn, beans, rice, potatoes, salads, and fresh vegetables and learning how to season them the right way. I mean, it's like I said, I, my mother-in-law actually joked the first time they, they saw me after about three months and I had gone from uh, one time they saw me I, after the 19 pounds and I was at 281, they saw me at my birthday party. And then another three months went by and I had dropped another 55 pounds and went from 281 to like two, I think 225 or 226, something like that. And they saw me and, uh, but they noticed every day I was walking around with food in my hand. I was eating, I was either eating a carrot or an apple or, you know, and I was, wanting to snack, but I was just snacking on the right things. And I never will forget my mother-in-law going, we've been here a day and a half and I have yet to see you without food in your hand. And I'm like, that's the best part. It's like, it's not about deprivation and everything about a diet is about depriving yourself. This is, I tell people, literally, you are gorging yourself to health is what you're doing. Yeah, I love, that's a great name for a book, Gorge Yourself to Health. There you go. That's what I'll call it. Yeah. Gorging Jay wants to know what you weigh now. I, I mean, you're a guy, so I think I can ask. I wouldn't ask that to a, a lady. Yeah, so I got down to about 199, 198, got into CrossFit and um, wanted to put on a little more weight. So right now I'm about 210, 212, but I'm almost 6'2". Um, and uh, I, I don't like it. I'm actually in the middle of starting to slim down again because I'm training for a marathon at the end of the year. And so um, so I'm, I'm probably going to, you know, slim down. And and uh, but, you know, when you do in CrossFit and a lot of those kind of harder exercises, you're you're eating a lot more calories to kind of satiate yourself. So. Um, so, yeah, so I, I'm about 210, 212 right now. Um, 
So did, did any exercise play a role in your hundred pound initial weight loss? You know, in the first three months it didn't because I was, I'd been so lethargic. I just, I couldn't move. Um, so the first three months didn't, but after that first three months, I got into running and really enjoyed that and then started weightlifting again. And then when we moved to Charlotte is when I got into CrossFit and I always loved lifting weights in high school. And it was, I just, I loved it. And I'm, and I'm a super competitive person and I never cared about being in competitions, but I love to go into the classes. And here I am 45, 46, my endurance is better. Um, you know, I'm squatting almost 400 pounds and you see these 20 and 30 year olds coming in there going, wait a minute, this dude's almost 50. And it's like, you know, and it was like, and they, and, and they called me plant man. That was kind of their little joke because they're all paleo and everything like that. And, um, so early on the first three months, it really didn't. But as I started losing weight and felt more mobile is when I started lifting and running and really getting into the, and, and it's like, I tell people, I love the real high intensity workouts because I love just feeling exhausted, but I always say the day after is the best feeling. Like I, I just, I feel motivated and my body feels good. And, and um, so, so yeah. So again, to answer Jay's question about 212, 210, 212. Uh, but like I said, getting ready to start training for a marathon. So that's going to slim up a bit and I need to be lighter to run. So um I, somebody's asking for a kitchen tour. A kitchen tour. They want to um, see if we could have a kitchen tour. Um, yeah, we can do that real quick. I mean, I haven't really showed it off and we could do the world premiere. So um, over here, we, did, we didn't do uppers. We just kind of did some towers. We got the floating shelves. We got counter to ceiling tile, uh, stove, more towers, the the windows. Um, I'm actually shooting at an angle because these get in the way <laughs> of the island. Um, there's my island. There's my fridge. Um, I didn't give up my coffee. I love coffee. I'm a coffee. I'm a coffee snob. Um, that's that's kind of it in a nutshell. We, we can do a, a deeper one at some point, maybe. But um, um, I don't know if you got to see any on that, but. That's so. beautiful. Really beautiful. Liz is well, it's, a, it's my wife. It's my wife. So, and I got, a, I did want to, I take two things I said I, I wanted to have in a kitchen. I've always wanted, and they do nothing to add to the ease, but it was totally a convenience thing. I've always wanted a pot filler. I wanted a pot filler over the stove and I wanted a farmhouse sink. So, I love farmhouse I, sinks. Yeah, those are great. And so I got, I got both of those. So <laughs> uh, what do you eat when you do CrossFit and how long before or after? So I, I don't like to exercise on a full stomach. I just don't. So I, I typically try to do a morning class if I can. Um, but so if I, if I, if I get up right before I go to work, I'd usually just drink water and maybe have a banana or something for the energy aspect, but then I'll go and do the workout. But as far as sustaining, um, you know, lunch, I don't like to eat heavy through the day. So usually like rice and blackened vegetables or steamed vegetables um, and try to fill up on as much of like leafy greens as I can. So I'll typically take a big mixing bowl and just dump a ton of spinach and do some kale and then chop up bell peppers and try to eat as much of that as I can. I, I, I tend to follow what Rich Roll does. So dinner is usually my big meal. I love a big meal at dinner. So I'll usually do like a lentil shepherd pie or we'll do a lentil loaf or chickpea meatloaf, mashed potatoes and corn, you know, things like that. I love sandwiches. So I'll do, you know, whole grain bread, do veggie sandwiches with hummus, things like that. Um, and you have to look for things that are a little more calorically dense when you're doing a heavy workout like that, just to sustain yourself and satiate yourself. So. There is a comment from Liz saying, can you give Shane a regular slot on the show? Well, I, could, <laughs> I don't know if he wants one. He hasn't even really finished today. Let's 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 see how he cooks first, Liz. 
<laughs> yeah. Thank you, though. That's very flattering. <laughs> We could arrange that because, you know, it's interesting because on January 1st, I went from doing a different guest every day to doing regular slots. I put out an email and we had more people wanting them than we had. So we have 28 regulars, which doesn't leave room for many people to come on. Uh, however, out of um, two people did did drop out because of the, they had big families and things. So there might be an opening. But let's see how you cook first. Well, that would be awesome. Yeah. You want to cook now or we want to talk more? What do you want to do? Can you cook and talk? I, I can try. I can try again. It's <laughs> chain and simple, you know, but um, can you see my, can you see my stove here? Can we, are we? It's beautiful. Okay. Thank you. So here, here's what we're going to do. Um, I love curries. I've always loved curries. Um, Indian curries, Thai curries, uh, but you know, Indian food has a lot of oil in it. Thai curries that usually have a lot of, coconut milk and things. And so this kind of came about uh, trying to kind of combine the two, the sweet and the savory and trying to, you know, grab something that's super quick. So um, the thing I love about curries though are spices. They are loaded with spices. And um, so, yeah, so let's get started. So my pan has been heating. I'm going to do half of a red onion chop and just throwing that in. And we're not using any oil because we don't cook with oil, right? Absolutely. We don't cook with oil. So um, now here, so I'm, so I'm going to let that simmer for just a second. I love cooking with red onions. I love the way they smell and they caramelize. And I tell people, I think I could just cook onions and mushrooms and throw them on rice and just eat that. Like onion, onions and mushrooms when they're sauteed. So um, we're doing some onions here. Now I want to tell, and then you got a blend of spices. So I'll tell you the spices I'm using. Oh, I just oh. So we're using curry powder. We're using cumin, coriander, paprika, ginger, turmeric, and a little bit of garlic powder. And I like to put all my spices together and mix them up before I add them. But here's something I learned, and people may call you and say, "Hey, that's a bunch of crap." But when I'm cooking with spices, I never could get, like when I made chilies and stuff, I realized I couldn't get the flavor that I wanted. And I love watching Chad and Derek Sarno. And they were saying when you use spices, when you're cooking your onions and your garlic, put your spices in that so it gets into the pan. And so if you're sauteing, before you add all your liquids, throw your spices in with like the things you're sauteing, sauteing like your garlic and your onions. It gets into the pan, it infuses the onions with flavor, and it's all over. So, so we've got the onions going, and I'm just going to go ahead and throw the, the curry powder over this and let that toast. And the smell that it gives off when it toasts is just unbelievable. And if you need to, it'll stick to the pan a little bit, but you can always add a little water. But... Probably get the, the phone over here so you can kind of see, but it, it really it covers the whole pan and just the smell of of uh, the aroma and it's just awesome. So I'm going to hit that with just a little bit of water. What kind of pan are you using, Shane? I these are ballerini pans. I found these on, uh, there was a website at one point called the Vegan Corner. They were Italian cooks and they were using these. These are on Amazon. They're super inexpensive. I've had one for six years. I absolutely, they, for me and for the money, they are the absolute best nonstick pan I've ever found. And so I've got two sets of them just because I liked them so much. And so they do woks, they do the small skillet pans, but it's ballerini. And like I said, I found them on Amazon. I love their stuff. And just, and I tell people, um, they um, they ask me if I use it for pancakes. I, they're, they're, they're an excellent pancake pan. I've never had a pancake stick. All right, so we're gonna move quick on this, but once, your spices in that time to kind of coat and cook. Um, you're going to add, uh, we're going to do a can of chickpeas, just a regular can of chickpeas that's drained. These are no salt added. 
So I'll drain just enough and I don't rinse them because there's no salt. So one can of chickpeas and then we're doing one can of no salt added diced tomatoes. We got to pour that in there. And I am supposed to have um, one and a half cups of almond milk. And I felt like I did so good of prepping today. I don't usually do mas and plas, but I tried today because I'm not a very organized person. And I did everything but the almond milk. And we've got to have the milk because that's going to be kind of the, uh, the creamy aspect. So... You're moving around and I still see you. Who's is somebody filming this? No, it's me. I'm multitasking. That's amazing. <laughs> so I've got to get um let's see. So we need one and a half cups of uh, I think it's one and a half, one and a half cups of unsweetened almond milk. So we're limiting when I first did this recipe because I wanted a Thai essence, I used regular coconut milk. And though it was a whole food, it was a plant-based recipe, it you know it. That was a lot of fat. So I wanted to figure out a way to try to make it less fattening. So I used almond milk, but it wasn't as thick as coconut milk. And I love a thick curry, but I figured out a way to get that, to get that uh, thickness. And I'm going to show you that in a second. But, but here's the thing. I mean, like, I tell people, like, you wouldn't even have to put the milk in it. Like, right now, I mean, just all the, like, the color and the flavor just already, just with the chickpeas and the tomatoes. So we get all that. You let it sit for just a second. And then we add one and a half cups of unsweetened almond milk. So it gives you that, that, that creamy, that look. So we're just going to mix that together. Really, that's it. You just kind of let it sit and it'll simmer for a second. We let that heat up. And then uh, what we're going to add to get that sweetness is um, maple syrup. We'll use a little bit of maple syrup. to So you get, the, you get the savory, the heat, and you get a little bit of the, the sweet. We're not going to use a ton. We're going to use about one to two tablespoons. I don't really measure anymore. I should, but I don't. All right. So so everything is mixed up. And then as that just simmers, I like to add a little bit of garlic powder actually on top of them once I have the liquid in and as it's cooking. But you can do it whenever. You can add real garlic. I think on the website, the recipe actually uses real garlic. But one, I couldn't find my real garlic. And two, it makes a big stinking mess every time you pop it open. And it, so I'm like, I'm using garlic powder today. So we, uh, got, we got a question. If you don't have to answer, if it's too personal, does Shane drink alcohol? Okay. It's not personal at all. Um, I will have a glass of wine every now and then. Uh, it is not a normal part. Um, I always try to make sure they are vegan so they're not filtered with fish bladder, but I do occasionally like a glass of red wine with my wife sitting on the porch, um, or a good craft beer. But again, it's more of a, it is more of the exception than the rule. So it's one of those things. If you came in and said, you can't have it anymore, I'd go, okay, no problem. But it's, yeah. you know. And Donna would like to know if there's a substitute for maple syrup. I use date syrup for everything. Date syrup is excellent. Um, I just have a harder time getting date syrup at a good price. So Does they have it at Walmart now. They do? Yes. The, my favorite brand, Organic. I love Date Lady, at least in my Walmart. She went. Okay. Well, Walmart. I'm going to have to go check our, I'm going to have to go check our Walmart because I, I, maybe I'm looking in the wrong place, but yeah. I, in the food section with all the sugar. And even though she gave me a discount code, it, it it's just easier to just go to Walmart than wait. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll have to check that out. Now I will I always keep dates on. So sometimes I'll make my own date paste, but it's a date paste would be a little too thick for this, but we actually keep, um, 
I ordered some date sugar. I found that. And I, I mean, it's still in the counter. It's in the pantry. But um, so, uh, but yeah, you could use date syrup for that. Um, you know, a lot, this is depending on people's conscience. I know some people that cook plant-based will use, they'll use honey. But again, that's a matter of conscience for someone. And I'm not going to bind anyone's conscience. We typically always use organic maple syrup. We have used date syrup. Um, I was going to ask you, uh, I've heard people go back and forth on agave. What's your position on agave? I don't think it's worse. I mean, from what I've heard from a nutritional standpoint, it's higher in fructose than high fructose corn syrup and fructose is metabolized in the liver. It's pretty sickly sweet. So I, I think, I think between that and maple syrup, maple syrup is the superior choice for okay, sure. Okay, good. I mean, we don't use it, but I mean... I mean, people say it's like people act like it's healthy and it's not sugar. Even it, it, it sure. is sugar. I mean, it is well, sugar. even date syrup is sugar. But what well, I like, it's kind, of, it's kind of like people that go, "Oh, I bought some organic gummy bears. Are those okay?" And I'm like, "Organic does not mean healthy. That it's, it, you're still eating a gummy bear." So, um, okay. Have, have you been able to recreate some of your favorite Southern classics? Yes, I have. Um, Spinach artichoke dip, meatloaf, mashed potatoes, cream corn, gravy, um, collard greens, black eyed peas. Now, everybody will say collard greens and black eyed peas. Well, those are vegan anyway, and those are plant based. Not how we do it in the South. They're not. We use lard and everything. We use tons of butter and everything. And there's always, always, always a big hunk of pork in every dish. So um, hash brown casserole. I've made that. It's on the website. Um, I do tofu bacon. Um, so, yeah, and, and that's kind of really where I felt like the blog was going to begin with was recreating the things I grew up on, but making them healthier. And like, actually, before I got in line with you, my sister. So we had a family member pass away and we have a lot of family in town and we're getting ready for the funeral this week. And my sister called, texted me and she goes, hey. And she and my aunt were talking and said, we were just talking. Do you think it's uh, a lentil loaf is on the menu? They, everybody here loves my meatloaf, my lentil loaf, my meatloaf. And, and so they're always shocked if I make mashed potatoes and cream corn. They just don't think about that being healthy and plant-based. And I'm like, well, it is the way I make it, you know? And, and so I, that's kind of a, uh, you know, that, that encourages me that they're calling me going, can you make this? We really want to hear, we want to have your meatloaf tonight. So. Um, so kind of back to the curry, you can leave it like this. It's ready to go now. It is ready to go. And it's like more of a soup, but I like thick curries. I love thick curries. So what I like to do, uh, to get that high essence is I'll take, um, a little bit of cornstarch and mix it with about a tablespoon of cornstarch and two or three tablespoons of water and mix it up and make a little slurry. And then I'll add it to the curry and just stir. And then it thickens up and it almost is like coconut milk. And um, I was on Rip Esselstyn's podcast last year and we were talking about curries and stuff. And he said one of the things they do to get that coconut flavor is you can add a little bit of coconut extract to this. So if you like those, that coconut overtone with... Um, with your curry, doing that is very simple, but we like, we'll add a little bit of cornstarch and as it cook, it, it thickens up and becomes more like that thick curry like you'd see in a Thai restaurant. And, and now we could say that this is really done, but I always say you need to get your greens in. That's not just something your grandmother told you. Like you need to be getting your greens in. So what I like to do, and in honor of you, I normally do spinach, but we're gonna throw kale in it today. And so, I like to put kale in it and just let it wilt and it gets in and the, it's just a great way to get, it, it even thickens it up and becomes all super hearty. And so I'll, I'll do the camera over so you can see this, but so there we go. That looks good. Can... Like serve it over rice maybe. Oh yeah. We will do it over rice and sometimes we'll just have it in a bowl. But um, we, we, we always make a big pot of brown rice and, um, 
and that that's typically what we serve it over but and there you go i mean it's done i mean that's it and that one of the reasons i always tell people this recipe is a prime example of the whole thing of the plant-based is eating and cooking is hard crap it's not good crap and you can't be quick and easy and be healthy and that's crap you can do all three and this technically if, if I'm not talking and I come in here and cook, I literally, if I've got to throw something together within, you could have this on the table in 15 minutes, easy. But I tend to like to let it cook for at least and let it simmer for 30 minutes just because I like to let all the spices and the flavors cook together. And, and this is one of our favorite, favorite recipes, favorite recipes. So do you ever use the Instant Pot, Shane? I've got two of them. Nice. All the time. All the time. We, when we travel, we take our Vitamix and we take both Instant Pots because, I mean, there's nothing you can't do with an Instant Pot. You just, we always we keep beans in one and rice in the other. Or we'll cook soups and stuff. Oh, I got to tell you before I get off, I'm so glad you brought that up. One of our favorite, favorite recipes, kids, everything when we first went plant-based was your red lentil chili. When we first got our first into pot, that is a staple in our oh house. My gosh, thank you. That's like the recipe I get the most comments on. And I, I just made it for the Google program. It's really good. Oh my gosh. It is. It is without, yeah. Oh, I'll make cornbread and we'll make the red lentil chili. Like when fall rolls around, I make it for football games. I mean, meat eaters eat that when I make it. And That's so- Yes. Sorry. I kind of had a fanboy moment. I didn't need you, to lose. Emma, you're, that's so good. That's so nice of you. Do you, have you ever been able to recreate something like chicken fried steak in a healthy vegan version? Y yes. I haven't put it out on the website. So I, there's, I just started messing around with lion's mane mushrooms. I don't know if you've seen those yet. They are phenomenal. Them, yeah. So I found a place close to here that sells them. So, um, but Several years ago, my, my kids actually asked me for something that was similar to Cracker Barrel, like chicken fried steak. I took um, some seitan and made it and baked it into little cutlets and made gravy. And that was surprisingly good and was one of those things where I got pulled away and never went back and really worked on the recipe. But I've been working a lot with battering and making things crispy. Um and so I'm glad you brought that up because one of my girls just asked me not too long ago as we were traveling, they saw a Cracker Barrel sign and one of them said, Daddy, we, you need to try to do like a chicken fried steak, like a healthier version. So it is on the, I have a big list of recipe ideas to go through and it's on there. So, yeah. Uh, Jennifer saying that she wants to see your before photo if you have it. And Marley says, do you have any falafel recipes with yogurt sauce? Uh, I do have a yogurt sauce, um, and it's funny she brings up the falafel. One of the recipes I'm working on now that I hope to have out in the next few weeks is a falafel slider, um, like the little sandwiches, and it, it has uh, sun-dried tomatoes in it, and um, let's see. I'm going to see if I can find... Uh, Yeah, I do. I wish I had thought about getting some uh, before and after photos on here. But I'll tell you what I'll do if it's okay. Um, if I can't get them up here before we get off is... Yeah, just email them to me and maybe we can make a thumbnail. If you, Especially if you have a before and after. I'm about to... Uh, let's see. Here, I think I'm about... I'm going to send you one right now. I think. Um, and then the, the philosophy. So if she goes to the website, um, if she goes to the website, there is a, a cassock on there. It's like a Turkish yogurt sauce with cucumbers. Um, if, she, if she'll go there, she will be able to um, access that recipe. It, we use that as a yogurt sauce. It's really good. Um, but yes, the falafel recipe is is coming, and I'm super excited. 
you know, I test, I tell everybody, I test um, my recipes with my wife and my kids. And if it passes the muster, that's kind of how I say I go public with the recipe. And so um, they love the falafel sliders. And there's actually going to have like a, a little hummus or a, a tahini drizzle that goes over it if you want to use it instead of mayo or anything. But um, but it, it, it uh, has, um, has, like I said, sun-dried tomatoes in it. So it has this tangy, it's a little different. But it's a it's total falafel, but it has a little bit of tangy aftertaste because I love sun dried tomatoes, oil free of course. So, yep, you sent it to me. Great. Oh, I I, I mean I could share my screen. You don't. Oh, wow. Gosh, you, you didn't like even have a neck. I mean, no, no, I had like three chins. Wow, let me let me let me share my screen and show this because it's it's profound. You don't have it, it also in a before and after, do you? Let me just. Oh uh, yeah, go ahead and show that. I may. Let me show that. Let me show this, guys. Look at this, guys. Can you see this? I hope so. I'm sharing my screen. Wow, even even your fingers, you know. Oh yeah, my my. I actually lost three ring sizes. Believe it or not. Yeah, I have got a, uh, going back through, because I have got a, uh, a before and after on here. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing now because, but that's it. Wow. Profound change. So it's a hundred pounds lost. Yeah. At my pinnacle, it was a hundred pounds. Yeah. I mean, I couldn't believe the difference in how I felt like, I mean, I mean, it's just you wake up every morning and you're just miserable. And it's not that you're even miserable with the way you look. It's just miserable with the way you feel. And I think that was the biggest thing for me is I, my wife was saying, Do you, cause I would tell people I have more energy. And she says, well, what does that feel like? Do you just feel like you're spastic or you're losing it? Or it was like, I'm just not tired and I just don't ache. And I think that was the biggest thing for me of, just, um, you know, the energy and how I felt every day and feeling like I could play with my kids without losing my breath and becoming short of wind and not having to worry about having a heart attack walking upstairs. I mean, that was that was the biggest thing for me. Yeah. Did you grow up overweight? No, I, I didn't. I was always athletic. I mean, I was trim. I um, never had a weight problem, but, you know, I think a lot of that was because, you know, growing up in the South, it's very hot and humid and you're out running and, and, um, so I played football and baseball from the time I was, could run. Like I said, I went to college on a football scholarship and I was always working out. And it was when I got out of college that, um, when I stopped working out and wasn't running and wasn't active, um, it just, it just, it slowly, slowly crept up on me. And when I moved to Nashville, when I was 20 years old, I weighed, I think I weighed 189 pounds. By the time I got married six years later, I weighed 240 pounds. And not a good 240 pounds. So, and then from there, it just, you know, it went on and on and on and on and on and until I reached the, the top of my, my unhealthiest at, at 300. So, but uh, let's see. That's amazing. There's a question from a live viewer named Linda. Have sure. you ever heard of Aveline or Aveline wine made by Cameron Diaz? It's vegan, organic, and no added sugar. You, you know, it's funny that she brings that up. Somebody asked me about that the other day. I think I got a message and I don't, I'm not sure if that was the brand. But it almost sounds exactly like it. I have not heard of it, but I was I'm glad she brought it up because I was trying to dig through and find it because my wife is the one. My wife is like the wine connoisseur. And so I, if when we have something, it's something she has picked out. So but that is great. I'll have to go look that up because I was racking my brain. I was positive somebody had told me that and I couldn't remember who it was or who they said invented it or or anything. So so tell her thank you very much. Yeah. 
Well, you're, you're telling her she's watching live. Shane, this is funny because um, on Chef AJ Live, we often play a game in the chat asking who the guest looks like. And I didn't even ask today, but people are saying, they're, they're saying two different people. Have you heard that you look like either of them? One person is saying Philip Seymour Hoffman and one person is saying Elton John. Okay. I've never heard the Elton John. I have heard Philip Seymour Hoffman. I've gotten Gordon Ramsay. Um Elton John, I'm flattered because I'm a huge fan of Elton John, but he's become a little bit portly, so I don't know what that means. I'm assuming that's a compliment. So, but I'll take it as a compliment because I love Elton John. But I've not heard that one. Philip Seymour Hoffman, I have heard. He was such a good actor. Oh, that movie. Oh, oh, when he passed away, I thought that was that was so sad. You know, it's a story of addiction, really, you know? Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's it's terrible. Yeah. Uh, Tracy wants to know, have you been able to influence extended family members or friends? Uh, yes. Not as much as I would hope to. Um, my sister, more than anything, uh, she actually got featured when it was still Engine 2. Uh, I helped her. She'd always struggled with eating disorders, and I worked on a menu for her, and she did really well. Um, I will tell you, oh, yeah, and then a buddy of mine that, I, that was best man in my wedding had high cholesterol. He found me, followed me, asked me to create him some recipes, and I created him some recipes, and he went back and was getting off his meds, but his doctor was trying to keep him on statins. And, um, and, uh, he just said, nah, I'm good. And, um, and what's really cool is living here. Um, I've hooked up with, um, a lady that owns a place called Boomble Fitness and she's a CrossFit instructor and she's gotten into eating more plant heavy and invited me down. I went and did a cooking demo. They had like 30, 40 people show up which was, we were blown away. And one lady approached me. Oh, okay. I found you a, um, I just sent you a, um, an, a, um, a before, and I'm about to send you a before and after together. That's great. Thank you. We'll get that on the thumbnail. Jennifer says, Shane, do you have a set schedule for the time you spent on your blog daily and balancing home life, et cetera? Um, I would love to tell you that I'm that organized, um, but I'm not. I, and so I, I really have to go to great lengths to self-administrate. Like I said, I'm your typical creative where if you looked at our dining room table, it's got photography stuff all over it. And, you know, my wife's desk over here in this extra room is very nice and neat and tidy. And, um, but on a daily basis, I do try to, create an outline um I think that and so I'll try to like on days of I'm going to cook and shoot um and then there are days I'm like I'm going to work on social media and then there are days I've got to work on the cookbook um I I have found for me um if I create an outline with goals of what I hope to do I get way closer to accomplishing them than doing nothing or even setting this hard schedule. It's hard for me to follow a hard schedule because I'm the type of person I get bored really easily. So I wanna get up, walk around, go do something or something like that. As far as our home life, um, I do try to do a thing where when I do work, um, I'll work, I'll take the kids to school and then come home and work while they're at school and try to do that. And my wife usually has projects going on. My wife and I, I will say this, my wife and I around two 30 every day, we kind of have our little routine where regardless of what we're doing, if it's not an emergency, just so we can kind of stay connected. We shut down between two and three. We have an afternoon cup of coffee together and we watch an episode of blue bloods, the Tom Selleck show. And so we cut out for like 40 minutes, 45 minutes or an hour idea kind of like instead of a siesta I love it yeah so we're together we're kind of talking about what we got going on we have our cup of coffee she'll go back to work or go get the kids I'll finish up what I'm doing 
And when the kids get home, they usually, or they'll have cross country practice or soccer practice. And I, I try to have dinner cooked and everything. And then usually when I work again is when they go to bed. How, old, it, how old are the ones that are still at home? Okay. So the ones that are at home, Macy is 16. She'll be 17 in August. Mackenzie just turned 15 and Millie Jane is 11. And then my son that's in college is he's 20. And then my daughter just graduated and she's 22. So one son, four daughters. One son, four daughters. It seems so calm and so chill. We look, we have, I, I don't know this. I, we love having children and it, it, yeah, it was crazy. It was absolutely. And it just, there's days you just want to, you know, but you know, we would have said we would have kept going if we could. All of ours were by cesarean. And so at the, by the fifth, the doctor said, you can't have any more. And, but it, it's, I don't know. I think it's because I just, I still have a hard time believing I'm 50 years old, you know, cause I don't know what a 50 year old is supposed to act like, I guess, you know, but it's like, I have fun with my kids. I like to go do things that they, they like to do. I think a lot of that is because growing up, we didn't really have any money. And I, I mean, it's not like we have a lot of money now, but it's like, I do things with my kids that I wanted to do. So I love water parks. I love, you, you sound, know, you sound like a really fun person. I'll, I'll play with you. I mean, if I mean, uh, I'll do stuff with you, if we were in the same town. Well, 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 we'll figure it out when I'm in I, California. And we'll, I, we'll, I have so many friends here, but they're all couples and nobody wants to like do fun stuff. Like they always just want to get together and eat as couples. I want to go to water parks. We have one. I want to go miniature golfing. I, that's the kind of friend I'm looking yes. for. Yes, that, that's that's me. That's us. And that's not, it's just me too. And that's all the people want to do here is like get together and eat as couples. I want to, I want to, I want to hang out with you. <laughs> <laughs> I think having kids, you know, is kept definitely, I, I feel like when they come and come out of that toddler stage and they get in that school age and, you know, and it is tough. I will say I, I love my children and I'll get emotional talking about them, just seeing how they've grown and matured. And, and it really is hard to see them grow and start to move on and do their own life. It's exciting because somebody told me, you know, you, your whole job is to raise your kids to leave. You know, that like so they can become self-sufficient. And and I think that's true to a big extent. But it's like, yes, it gets crazy. But it's like seeing my daughter like have her first full time big person job. And I go, I just don't feel like I should be in that stage. And but but they they are fun kids. They love to do fun things. They love to act crazy. And and, you know, we have a couple of introverts in there, but they my daughter is dating a guy we think is going to be our future son-in-law and he's in flight school at an air force base. So he's training to be a pilot and he was a guitar player in a rock band. And so I was a guitar player and her friends had never really seen me play guitar. So we go to visit her. My, she went to Mississippi state. My son's at Mississippi state and the band was playing at a really big club down there. We showed up for sound check. And I walked up behind her boyfriend while they were sound checking. I said, let me borrow your guitar. And so they turn around and I'm just up there ripping it with them. And then it was so funny because this was, this was a place where all the college kids come to hang out and they brought me on stage that night. And I was like, you know, the, the, the dad in the dad band that night, and, you know, so, but all that to say, yeah, my wife would tell you, she considers herself fun challenged. And so, you know, she's the quiet introvert and, but, you know, when I pull her out, it's like seeing her kind of let her hair down is, is, is awesome. So, but yeah, I just, I love to do things that my kids love to do, you know? And so, and, and they say their kids, their friends tell them, yeah, your dad doesn't act like our dad. And then they find out, you know, I'm a blogger and Andre's a graphic designer. And then they think we just have cool jobs. So, so we get, we're kind of the do drop in, which we love. We love to host people, but I'm with you. If people want to invite me over just to eat. I'm like, that's good for a moment, but we got to go do something. So that's great. He, you know, one of the viewers, this is, uh, we have another look alike. Tell me what you think. I want to say her name. And I think you kind of maybe do look like him a little bit. She is saying uh, Jim Gaffigan. That's what she. <laughs> I've heard that one a couple of times. Yeah. Yes, I've heard that one a couple of times. So again, that, all cool people. 
Well, this, the recipe looks great. And guys, it is a simple recipe. He's just cooking it longer and longer because he says it tastes better that way. Well, I'm actually about to taste it. I just made me a bowl of it. So let me grab a spoon. And I'm going to pop it up. And... Oh, somebody's saying they love your potato soup recipe. Oh, yeah, the Instant Pot potato soup. Yes. Okay, look at this right here. It looks so thick. Oh, when you put the cornstarch in it, Oh, that's so good. I hate to brag on myself, but that's just so good. I mean, that's just. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Brag. What, what are your family's favorite recipes of yours, especially your children? Well, um, I would say um, the, the bulgogi, the Korean barbecue beef, the vegan bulgogi that I make that's on the site. We use soy curls to make that. They absolutely love that. They like this. Um, of course, mashed potatoes and the cream corn. But if, if, if I were to ask them, what do you want me to cook tonight? They're going to go bulgogi. Like they love the. Oh, full bulgogi. <laughs> <laughs> bulgogi. I just like saying it. That's funny. Well, you have been a delightful guest. Really. I really enjoyed talking to you and I. I'd love to have you on again, even if it's not for a regular slot, it's really going to be up to you. We'll talk after the show. Sure. I want to know how people, I, is, even though everything I'm going to ask you is in the show notes, people sometimes just listen on the podcast, so they're not looking. How can people get in touch with you, follow you, get your books? What's the best way to stay connected? The best way to stay connected is go to shaneandsimple.com and subscribe. It's free. You'll get, and you'll stay connected because I send updates of when recipes are posted everything like that. Everything that's Shane and Simple, that's the best place to go. The second best place to go is at Facebook. And I think it's just uh, facebook.com slash Shane and Simple Cooking. Um, and there's two groups there. There's the fan page and then there's just a group. And that's one I kind of let self administer or run because people can post questions, they interact with each other. And it really has created this really good community. So you can go to Facebook, there's Instagram, but also something I didn't mention, um, I'm going to be the new host of a podcast called Real Men Eat Plants, and that's going to be coming out uh, in a month or two, full bore. I'm super excited, and um, we're kind of in partnership with the company. Uh, basically, uh, Glenn Merzer, his show, and I are under the same umbrella. We're with the same conglomerate. So, And that's uh, called Real Men Eat Plants, right? And that's podcast- because- and that is that a podcast or a YouTuber or both? Well, the, the website is realmanyplants.com and that's the head head the the head company or whatever how you want to say it. But um, the Real Many Plants podcast is under that and I will be the new host for that. So we're super excited about that. So we've got to get you on to that'd talk be, about your that'd be great. Well, thank you so much. That's wonderful. And but, the book, when is, when is the bread making book or the coming out? And is there a title for it yet? It's called Baking Vegan Bread at Home. But, you know, think about it. Is bread, isn't bread in general vegan or am I? Most of it is. The, the unique thing about this book is they were wanting me to. Re- so there are 72 bread recipes in this book. And so you can imagine the research was quite strenuous. But um, the. There's a lot of recipes that are European breads, cheddar and onion breads and things like that, that they were wanting to mimic from their dairy field counterpart, brioche breads, Japanese milk breads, um, things like that. And so that's where a lot of the, I would say the non-compliant stuff had to come in. But, uh, but yes, in general, most bread is vegan, sourdoughs and things like that. So Great. Well, Shane, this has been delightful. I can't thank you enough. I mean, I'm just going to tell you, I'm going to take the opportunity. Aww. I, I, it's weird because I said the same thing to Rip Estelson. Like, you guys are my heroes. And I feel like, why the heck am I on your show? I should be begging you to come over here and oh, please. I didn't even know you knew who I was. You could have come on so sooner. So thank you, Lauren, for introducing us. 
Yes, and thank you for the opportunity. I really okay. appreciate it. There will be another. We'll talk right after the show. And Sounds great. I don't know how you feel about balsamic vinegar, but you get two free bottles for being on the show, courtesy of Thomas Allen from California Balsamic. We love it. We love it. So Perfect. Thank you so much, Shane. Thank you all. Take care. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow at 11 a.m. when we're going to talk to Joy Foods. They have amazing products, just one ingredient, instant almond, almond milk, cashew milk, and now oat milk powder. Take care, everyone.